Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Surgery Live. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Sophia Aspaugh, who, who runs our trauma sessions here on Surgery Live, uh, to, to introduce Dr. Wolf. And so, Dr. Aspaugh, I, I hand it over to you. I'm very excited for this up and coming topic. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Wolf. Dr. Wolf hails from Fort Collins, Colorado, where he was born and raised. Since then, he's lived all over the United States. He attended New York University for undergraduate, then went, then went to Kansas for his medical schooling. He stayed in the Midwest and completed his surgery training at Cleveland Clinic Akron General. He then briefly ended his tour of the Midwest and headed west to the West Coast, where he completed a fellowship in surgical critical care at Stanford University. Uh, then Cleveland Clinic and family drew him back to the Midwest, and he was recruited as a trauma critical care surgeon at Akron General, where he currently practices. At Akron General, he's very active clinically and sits on several quality committees. Outside of work, he enjoys staying active and being outdoors. Specifically, he likes being with his dogs, Ella and Bailey, and his wife, Rachel. And he enjoys playing sports like soccer, golf, and volleyball. And uh, recently, he's been become a subject matter expert on uh, rib fixation, surgical fixation of ribs in trauma patients. So I will hand it over to him to enlighten us with this topic. Thank you, Dr. Aspot, for that introduction. Um, without further ado, I think we'll get started today. We've got a little bit of time to talk about a lot of things, so let's get rolling. So the title of my talk today is Surf the Wave, and surf being what we can colloquially refer to as surgical stabilization of rib fractures. Um, so surf the wave developments in surgical stabilization of rib fractures. I just wanted to talk about some of the developments of the last several years and just kind of describe where we're at today. Uh, I have no significant financial disclosures. Um, here's our quick outline of what we're gonna go through. And just to give you some uh, insight into rib fractures in general. So rib fractures are um, sustained in nearly 15% of trauma patients. Nationally, we have 350,000 patients admitted with rib fractures every year. And thoracic blunt trauma accounts for 25% of blunt trauma mortality. Um, I do want to highlight some of our experience at this institution with respect to rib fractures. So in the last three years, you can see here, our trauma admissions totaling to near 2,000. Our rib fracture patients out of those total admissions is close to 15% and steady. Uh, our flail chest percent in those patients is around 5%. We'll talk about flail chest later, but it's just a more severely injured chest wall. Um, and our total death rate at all of the comers is roughly 5%, and flail chest is pushing 15-20. Um, and those numbers are in line with what I'm going to show you next. Uh, a lot of these are national numbers collected. Um, again, 10% of patients have flail chest. That's very close to what we're seeing. Um, mortality rates of 10, 20%. That's what we're seeing at our institution. Most common injury related, uh, most common concomitant injury is TBIs, which is actually also the most common cause of death. Um, they also have uh, commonly intra-abdominal injuries, most commonly palate organ injuries, liver and spleen. Um, and I don't want to belabor a lot of these numbers too much, but really I want to just demonstrate how severely morbid and um, uh, dangerous these fractures can be to our patients. So um, flail chest patients, 59% require mechanical, mechanical ventilation, 20% get pneumonia, 14% get ARDS, 7% sepsis. We already talked about the 10, 20% mortality numbers. Um, these are severely injured patients. Um, and I also wanted to give you some sense that the number of rib fractures increases that risk. So, um, and one study here noted uh, all patients over the age of 65, each fractured rib increases your odds of death by 19% and your risk of pneumonia by up to 27%. Um, additionally, long-term outcomes are affected. Uh, patients have seen to have PFTs that are abnormal at uh, long-term follow-ups as well as long-term pain, long-term disability. Uh, this is seen over and over again in some of the studies. Um, and then again, disposition. 
88% of those over the age of 65 do not return to their previous level of independence. Uh, so these are severely morbid uh, injuries to our trauma patients. Uh, I did want to talk about some of the history of thoracic trauma and plating just to get a better sense of where we are today. Um, really, the understanding of uh, blunt trauma to the chest really evolved through the early 20th centuries through the World Wars. And uh, you can thank the automobiles for teaching us a lot about flail chest, um, as they were described as projectile, projectiles of destruction in early studies. Um, but really, our understanding of blunt trauma to the chest uh, revolves around two key principles, and that's flail chest and pulmonary contusion. Uh, flail chest is mainly what we're focusing on right now because that is a anatomical change in the chest wall where you have three or more fractures fractured in two or more places. Uh, and this causes abnormal chest physiology, abnormal respirations, and leads to respiratory failure. Uh, these are the patients that you see that paradoxical motion that you'll hear about where during normal chest wall excursion, where you normally have expansion of the chest wall together, you have this floating segment of ribs that actually collapses back on the lungs while you're breathing, which makes it very difficult to take normal respirations. Um, the term flail chest was first coined in 1955 in a study that I'll often refer to again shortly. Um, but the other flip side to this coin is pulmonary contusion. And with a blunt injury to the chest, you often have injury to the lung parenchyma below. Um, and this leads to leaky alveoli, increased shunt fraction, and a really a global and bilateral inflammatory response, which you can see um, it's very similar to an ARDS type picture. Um, so how do we treat these? Uh, medically, pain control is our number one weapon. So many studies have shown this, but the uh, odds ratio of death actually decreases by 40% with adequate pain control. And the idea is that your patients are then able to fight through the fractures and take normal respirations and avoid further complications. Um, other things I mentioned here, you'll see often, um, a lot of these things are still level two evidence. Um, fluid restriction is one, uh, regional anesthesia is one. I have steroids and antibiotics on there, which are actually not indicated right off the bat. Um, and interval, internal stabilization is another which is also mechanical ventilation and is typically only recommended in the setting of respiratory failure. Um, so again, staying historical for a second, 1949 case report uh, by Heroy described their year experience with 63 motor vehicle crashes that year, nine with this steering wheel or flail chest, four of which who developed respiratory embarrassment. And they described this paradoxical motion as leading to diminished aeration, increased respiratory rate, inability to cough, and marked anxiety. And they thought the patients that displayed uh, these findings uh, really were indicated for early surgical intervention. Uh, fortunately for those patients, this is what we had to offer in the 50s, uh, traction via fairly barbaric methods. This gentleman got wood screws through his sternum, which eventually pulled through, and then um, with two small incisions to the anterior table of the sternum, placed this clamp to uh, traction, which was left for 17 days in order to allow some healing before this guy was released. Um, he was in the hospital for 24 days. Um, here are some other options with similar effect. Uh, this is a clothes hanger that was screwed into this gentleman's chest. Uh, you can also apply it with lateral traction to lateral flail segments. Um, they've also tried things like hard wooden boards, which are sutured to depressed rib fragments to bring them up to the chest. Um, that bottom center picture was actually bar barbecue skewers, which was used um, to some effect. There's also hard wires that are sutured to outsides of the rib and chest wall, um, or the iron lung before mechanical ventilation really started evolving through the 50s um, was initially used as well. Um, through the 80s and 90s, titanium plates started taking more of a forefront. They offered some strength with more stability and a lower profile. And so this clearly became a better option as they started developing. Um, and more contemporary surgical options has really transitioned to from more maximally invasive exposures to muscle sparing, keyhole, intrathoracic approaches to really minimize uh, further chest wall injury when we're going to repair these fractures. And just a quick look at some of our current technology available, you can see that these plates are um, pre-drilled, pre-formed, uh, ready to go, and um, 
much lower profile than some of the things that have been used in the past. Um, and just to make sure we're on the same page, the current therapies do combine both medical and surgical modalities. We talked about flail chest and pulmonary contusion. Typically, we recognize flail chest as something that can be assisted with uh, surgically, whereas pulmonary contusion uh, it typically would not derive much benefit from a surgical intervention. This is more of a medically managed situation. Um, but we do combine both modalities. And surgery typically has been seen as a uh, use for failure of non-operative therapy. Um, in 2009, a study was done with trauma surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, and thoracic surgeons, and the majority of them thought that rib fracture uh, fixation was indicated in selected patients. However, at that time, only 25% had actually ever performed uh, or assisted in surgical repair of a flail chest. And uh, of those who thought fixation was rarely indicated, 90% of them wanted to see more randomized trials to change their opinion. So I'm going to show you that now. This is the five randomized trials that have been performed for surgical fixation of the chest, uh, all of which you can see have been done in the last 20 years. Um, they have uh, an end value of somewhere around 30 to 50 patients. These were all done on patients with flail chest. They all had slightly different inclusion criteria and um, uh, methods. However, their results are pretty remarkable, and these are all statistically significant findings that have been shown through other studies over time. Decreased ICU length of stay, decreased hospital length of stay, decreased pneumonia, decreased mechanical ventilation, decreased rate of tracheostomy placement. Um, and many of them also show improved long-term outcomes followed by spirometry and chest wall anatomy. So I don't talk too much more about this through my talk, but I want this to uh, really stick in your head. Flail chest has been shown over time that fixation does have improved outcomes for our patients. Um, this has not been shown on mortality, however, but these other things I think speak for themselves. Uh, in 2016, the Chest Wall Injury Society started forming, and this is a society formed of trauma surgeons as well as a lot of other surgeons across specialties and a lot of other providers. Um, and their mission was optimizing the operative and non-operative care of the patient with a chest wall injury. And just a snapshot of um, rib fixation at that time, this is a view of total fixations from the year 20, 2007 to 2014. Um, you can see the graph on the right side showing that everything is escalating in the sense that roof fixation is happening more and more often. Um, and you can see in the bottom left, most of these are happening on non-flail patients. Um, and a lot of them are happening at level two, level three centers. Um, so this is the background of time that CWIS really started developing. And I think their primary goal was to really to find the optimal patients that are getting fixed, um, as it seemed at that time that the pendulum had kind of been swinging the other direction. Uh, so their baby up until this point is the non-flail study, and a lot of the studies that they have designed have been working towards this point. Uh, the non-flail study was designed to find a set of patients without flail chest, so that was actually exclusion criteria, um, and see if they could still show a derived benefit with uh, surgical fixation. So what they did was they defined a population with equipoise, meaning 50% of the uh, patients or survey, uh, excuse me, surgeons surveyed thought that this patient population should be fixed and 50% thought that they shouldn't. Um, and I'll go into that in a second what that was, but starting with that inclusion criteria, they then directed what the non-operative management would be, so that would be more standardized. They influenced the operative management, so that that would be more standardized. Then their hypothesis would that SERF would lead to improvements in pain control, narcotic consumption, pulmonary function, risk of complications, and quality of life. And here's the inclusion criteria that they use, and that was that you had three or more rib fractures on the same side that are bicortically fractured, severely displaced, meaning more than 50% of rib width displacement. And then also showing two or more of the following, respiratory rate of greater than 20, incentive spirometry less than 50% predicted, uh, numeric pain score greater than five out of 10 um, after pain, um, multimodal pain is, in, is started and also poor cough. And I just wanted to highlight this quickly because I thought this was really interesting. 
these are the four things that the non-soil study predicted. This was that study in 1951, and they're describing really very similar processes. So this, they really knew what they were talking about in the 50s. We just didn't have options really to take care of these patients better, but um, these are eerily, eerily similar. So uh, what was the non-operative management they standardized? It's really a multimodal pain management with scheduled Tylenol and ibuprofen, gabapentin, local regional pain modalities, which they left up to the um, hospital itself as far as whether they like um, epidurals or spinals or um, serratus blocks or what have you. So they left that up to the care of the team that was involved. And the operative management that they um, standardized was a minimally invasive approach to rib fixation. They did put a time frame on less than 72 hours to the operating room. As many studies have shown, the earlier you operate on these patients, the easier the surgery is and the better they do with minimal rates of less rates of pneumonia. Um, they propose a keyhole approach, which I'll show you here in a second. Uh, they propose doing a VAT with evacuation of hemothorax with every case. You know, all these rib fractures always have bleeding. There's always some hemothorax, whether you see it or not. Um, and retained hemothorax can be a significant issue with these patients. So they propose always VATS and evacuate. Um, they also propose an evaluation for the diaphragm, evaluation of the diaphragm at that time to evaluate for diaphragmatic injuries, which can be very difficult to see on CAT scan. Um, they also propose a nerve block of some sort at that index operation. Um, and obviously, then the end goal of this is all to uh, complete SERP. So, what's the keyhole approach? The keyhole approach is making your incision over the anterior border of the latissimus, um, mobilizing all of the muscles uh, of the chest wall that are attached to the scapula, and getting beneath all of those muscles and getting great exposure to the chest wall with a smaller incision. Um, and you can use a wound wound protector and a retractor to do this. Um, I'll show you a video here in a second, but what we're talking about is an incision over the auscultory triangle, which is that window created by the border of the scapula, the trapezius and the latissimus, um, where you have minimal muscular coverage, you're avoiding the scapular coverage and you have a great window into the chest wall. And if you enter in that space, you enter in a space without vital structures that gives you great exposure. Here's a video that I wanted to demonstrate with this. This is through a five millimeter, five centimeter incision, excuse me, um, a wound protector inserted into the wound. You can see that ribs five and six are readily visible there below the tip of the scapula, which you can faintly see marked above them. And then with minimal retraction, you can get one rib space above and one rib space below very easily. So, um, this is with a small incision, but you can imagine how much chest wall you can get through this very quickly um, with this approach. Uh, so what were their findings? Um, the non flail study found that pain control was statistically improved starting at two weeks. Um, right initially after surgery, their narcotic consumption was actually higher, but that trended towards statistical significance again at that two weeks and beyond. Um, PFTs and quality of life was unchanged, and the study postulated that that was because this was a relatively uninjured population overall with non-flail chest, um, so they were not surprised to not see that. Risk of complications uh, was statistically decreased with the sense of intrapleural complications. This is specifically related to, again, that hemothorax that I referred to and retained hemothorax, which can be an issue. Uh, so this authors concluded through this study that this supports a role for SERP without flail chest. Um, this is a heat map of rib fracture distribution in all comers in this study, a total N of almost 400. And I just wanted to demonstrate this because using this minimally invasive approach, this is where our incision goes. This is where our wound retractor goes. This is where the majority of fractures on almost all comers are. So although there are more approaches described and there's obviously gonna be fractures in other places, um, this approach gets you the vast majority of fractures that we see. Uh, so what are the societies saying? Well, these are some trauma societies that I have referenced here. 
um, all of these society guidelines have been written really relatively recently. Um, but interestingly, in the realm of this um, studied area, a lot of the studies are even more recent than this. So um, East wrote two guidelines, 2012 and 2017, which both rated actually level three evidence for fixation of the chest based on the available uh, evidence. Um, some of the more recent uh, guidelines coming out actually up to date, I did reference because it was written by a prominent critical care surgeon. Um, and in 2021, it's very recent, is written to say that SERP is actually indicated in impending or actual respiratory failure in patients that have failed chest or three or more fractures. This is what the Chest Laundry Society says. Um, and they say similar to what I just highlighted. Going through their algorithm here, they look at chest wall instability and they look at flail chest. And they say, if you have chest wall instability, uh, fixation is indicated. Um, additionally, if you have three or more fractures and you have uh, two or more of those pulmonary physiologic derangements that we talked about, respiratory rate, consent spirometry, pain, or cough, uh, you also have an indication for surgical fixation. Just to give you a highlight on some of the things that are happening even more recently in the field, um, surgeons are really pushing the envelope to see where this indication truly lies, uh, where we can find further benefit. These are some studies highlighting um, that they're studying patients over the age of 65. The non-flail study capped their population at 80. So this uh, study looked at the age of over 65. They actually had tremendous results of improvement with uh, SERP. Um, this study population looked at the age of 80 and beyond. Uh, they also concluded they found improvements. I'm not going to go into these studies too much. I just wanted to highlight some of the other things happening in the field. Um, and another thing that we didn't get to talk about, but traumatic brain injury I mentioned is a common concomitant injury. A lot of studies that have been out previously actually um, excluded patients with TBI. This study looked at patients with moderate to severe TBI and thought that there was still actually indication to fix some of these patients. So we're looking at different fields. Um, we're running short on time and I wanna to get to some cases, but cost interventions are looked at as well. Um, now really, if you look at decreasing ICU time, mortality, complications like to stay, it's not surprising that you're gonna find some cost benefit there on fixing these patients. These studies usually show, and again, not surprisingly, the more severely injured and the younger patients found more cost benefit. And last thing I wanted to talk about is some long-term results. Um, just jumping to the bottom line here, 94% would recommend to a family or friend getting their chest wall fixed because these patients had it done and they thought their experience was good. And 86% of them said they, their chest looked and felt normal at over a year follow-up. So um, these patients really do get long-term benefit from this as well. Um, so with that all being said, I wanted to jump into a couple cases. This first case I wanted to talk about is a 32 year old male. Uh, he fell 20 to 30 feet from a tree stand. He had a left one through nine root fracture with a flail three through seven, bilateral pneumothoraces, minimal hemothoraces, grade three spleen, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, he had the following pain, uh, um, minimal cough, minimal IS. He was on actually nasal cannula. Here's an image of his chest wall. It gives you some idea where his fracture line occurred. You can see it there, anterior to the scapula, running through the chest wall, uh, heading posteriorly towards uh, the inferior fractures. So we'll break from the presentation quickly, and I just want to ask the audience, would you fix this patient? So we have a few answers. Um, most people are saying yes. Um, and I would agree. We have a young patient with a flail chest. We've already talked about some of the indications for fixation, flail chest certainly being one of them. Um, this patient did have a TBI, uh, which we didn't go into too many details about, but I agree. I think fixation would be indicated. Uh, this was actually done with our orthopedic team. I don't have a chest wall reconstruction picture of his after, unfortunately. 
uh, but I did want to share this with you. Um, so this was done by orthopedic colleagues. This is actually just a coronal image of his pre uh, fixation. This is a presentation picture and you can see, I hope you can see my mouse here, but this little blip in his diaphragm. So this was not read as an injury on this initial presentation. Um, the team that fixed him does external plate fixation. They do not do a VATS or any internal interrogation of the diaphragm. This is this gentleman two years after. So he clearly had a missed diaphragmatic injury that developed a diaphragmatic hernia. He presented to the emergency general surgery clinic a couple of years later with an obstructed um, hernia through that defect. So I wanted to show this case to highlight part of the proposal that I'm discussing is that the fixation of these patients does include a VATS and does include internal interrogation of the chest wall. And I think that that is important for the hemothoraces that we talked about and evacuating those. Um, but unfortunately for this gentleman also gives you the chance to evaluate the diaphragm and look for injuries that can that can unfortunately be missed. So um, that is potentially something that could have played out for a better outcome for that patient. Uh, case number two, this is a 71 year old female. She was T-bone MVC accident. She had a completely destroyed right chest wall, broke every rib on that side with a flail chest of four through eight. She also had a liver lack um, some transverse process fractures. She was taken to the operating room on presentation for hypotension and got packed because of her uh, liver laceration, didn't have any other intra intra-abdominal injuries. So she was intubated uh, post-trauma presentation for other reasons, um, but question still stands. Would you fix this patient? And here we'll work on the study in one second. Here's a quick representative image of her uh, 3D recons with more an anterior distribution of her fracture line that you can see running um, about my mouse line here. Dr. Wolf, we have a question from the audience. During uh, fixing flail, do both fractures need to be fixed? It's a good question. Um, most of the studies that have looked at this attempt to fix everything that they can. And um, unfortunately, with the timing that we have, we don't have too much time to talk about a lot of the surgical nuances, but some of the fractures that they approach the spine are much more difficult to approach. Uh, some of the fractures that get higher into rib one and two are difficult to approach. Um, so we we fix whatever we can, and that's what most of these uh, authors have described in their studies, um, finding the results that they had. So we fix as many as we can reach is the answer. Dr. Wolf, another question from the audience. Mm -hmm. With internal fixation, what challenges or concerns are being discovered? Do patients develop chronic pleuritis? Uh, do they have the same kind of pulmonary improvement uh, as external fixation when you do internal? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, that is a newer technology that was actually released very recently, so we don't really have the long-term data to answer that question. Um, what I will say is that it was proposed because it gives you a minimally invasive approach to approach the similar fracture lines that you otherwise would have had to make additional incisions or additional exposure. Um, and it offers you that plating strength to those ribs that is uh, comparable to an external fixation. But unfortunately, I don't have answers for long-term data on that. Speaking of additional incisions, a question from the audience: If you if you do a bilateral approach, do you, do you fix both sides? If if there are bilateral fractures that have intimation or, or fixation, yeah, oftentimes we will. I think so. Most of these patients actually, depending on the fracture line, again, your positioning in the operating room has to give you your best exposure. Um, so if you had a patient that you could position in such a way that you can approach fractures on both sides at the same time, then surgeons often, often will do that. So, yes. Any thoughts on using cryoprecipitate while doing fixation? Uh, cryoprecipitate. 
so I'm not um, understanding that question exactly. Cryoablation. Cryo right? Cryoablation, right. Yes. Um, yes, absolutely. I actually prefer that method as my neurolysis. So instead of a rib block, my preferred way for numbing the chest wall is actually cryoablation. And I did not get to go in that in this talk, but um, as I did say, the authors did suggest some form of rib blockade at the time of the operation. And actually my, my preferred approach would be cryoablation. And that essentially what that is for people that don't know, it's a um, catheter that externally freezes the nerve and causes a delayed healing response, which gives you a numbing sensation for a matter of weeks. So you you get that numbing to the chest wall that persists for longer than any initial block could ever give you. I know we're we are running short on time. Uh, while we're waiting for maybe a, an additional question or two from the audience, I have a question for you. Uh, what is the timing for the surgical stabilization of rib fractures? When they meet criteria, do you do it fairly early? Do you wait for them to see how they do with your other anesthetic blocks and multimodal pain control and whatnot and give them a few days? What's kind of the optimal timing to, to fix these? Yeah, good question. Optimal timing has actually been shown to be as soon as you can get to them. Um, so they've pushed it faster and faster as we get better at identifying patients that will benefit from fixation um, based on the distribution of fractures or, or being able to evaluate them after they present. We're getting them into the operating room sooner and sooner. Um, most of the centers that are getting more used to doing this are actually showing time to operating room less than 48 hours. Um, but the studies out there show that the earlier you operate on these patients, the better the outcomes are with respect to uh, pneumonia rates. Um, and the difference between 72 hours and later actually on average was over an hour additional operating time if you wait um, because it's more difficult as these fractures set in and the injuries are more uh, delayed, the surgeries get much more difficult. So case duration was less than an hour faster if you do it sooner. And I guess one more question and we'll we'll close it out. Who generally performs these? I know you mentioned that only in that 2009 study, only about 25% of surgeons, trauma surgeons, orthopedic surgeons and whatnot had actually done or assisted in these in these cases. And there's different local regional practices, but who by and large performs the surgical stabilization of rib fractures and should we be training more trauma surgeons to do so since we tend to care for the majority of the rib fracture patients? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think you mentioned some of the challenges that really does depend on the institution and what kind of help you have available with. Um, what I would definitely fight for is that trauma surgeons should take the front seat in this. These are our patients and we see them every day. We see them in the clinic. We know what they're battling with. Um, so really finding the patient population that would get the most benefit is on the onus of the researchers. And once we find that, I think the trauma surgeons should really drive to get these patients the help that they deserve. Um, who actually does that fixation is a great question. I think trauma surgeons that are trained in it and comfortable in it uh, are certainly capable. Although I will definitely say our orthopedic colleagues and our thoracic surgeon colleagues all have experience to add that we um, can benefit from. So I think involving a multidisciplinary approach is very reasonable. Um, but I think the biggest thing I would say is that trauma surgeons should really drive this and take ownership of this process. Well, thank you so much for an excellent uh, summary and uh, thank you to the audience for uh, participation. Fantastic discussion and great questions. Yeah, thank you guys so much. That was a fantastic presentation. Great discussion. Great audience participation. Thanks to everyone. Uh, as a reminder, we will. So our next surgery live will be Friday, August 13th. Uh, Dr. Clayton Petra will be talking about robotic TARS and weighing expedited recovery versus soft tissue cosmesis. We do meet every Friday at 6.45, except the first Friday of the month, which is why we won't be here next Friday. Um, thanks to Medtronic for helping to make this, uh, for sponsoring and making this possible. We'll see you next time on Surgery Live.